Hi, uh, to my thanks a little bit. Uh, my name is uh, Bob Gilmore. I'm a professor here at the uh, Drexel University Physics Department. I live upstairs with my colleagues. Here are two, uh, Dan Cross, Tim Jones, three doctors, both of them. They'll be getting their PhDs in a little while. And uh, they've helped a lot. Um, <coughs> until this presentation, I told people that, that Tim was hiding up in the projector because he created this marvelous showpiece, but he's here now in the flesh, so he can at least take credit for this. Uh, and these guys put up with me. I'm Mr. Incompetent when it comes to computers, despite this look. And Tim's here to rescue me when I do something stupid, which I'm doing all afternoon. Um, what I'd like to do is tell you what kind of fun we're having. We're doing research on nonlinear dynamics, and we're just having a blast. Uh, we enjoy it very much. Uh, there are some down days when we don't discover anything, but mostly it's up and a lot of fun. So uh, what is nonlinear dynamics? Well, the, the snide answer is, well, it's dynamics that's not linear. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me rephrase it. What we're studying is something called chaos, also a big help. So what is chaos? Chaos is a kind of um, behavior that a lot of uh, physical systems exist in. And uh, chaos is maybe not exactly what you're thinking. Chaos, maybe you're thinking means you can't predict anything like random. But chaos is far from random. Chaos is predictable. Uh, predictable and not predictable. So here I am sounding like a politician. But I'm not a politician, I'm a physicist, so you better hold my toes to fire and explain what being predictable and not predictable means at the same time. So 400 years ago, Newton uh, explained to us how to predict, how to predict in physics, how to predict in the solar system. Newton says, Newton's laws are F equals dp dt. What that means is if you specify the forces on something, like a planet, like the moon, for example, or an apple, specify the forces, then this gives rise to a set of equations. Technically, they're called differential equations. And you can integrate those. You can solve those and tell exactly where this particle, uh, planet, moon, apple, is going to be forever into the future. And uh, for 300 years, uh, we believed them. Uh, of course, motto, it's a long story, but it's a fun story. And we believed him until about 100 years ago when somebody said, hey, wait a second, that's not quite true. Example, <clears throat> here's, let's say, Mars, and I, I, I know what the forces are on it, and so I integrate the equation, I tell where Mars is infinitely far into the future. Great. Then some guy comes along, say, your student, say, Tim or Dan. He says, wait a second, what do you use for the initial condition of Mars? And I say, oh, well, Mars is right there. And they say, well, how do you know? Maybe it's 10 centimeters off this way or 10 centimeters off that way. Whoops. All right, so instead of predicting its position infinitely far into the future, I can only predict it, say, 20 million years into the future. And then these wise guys say, well, you know, maybe not 10, maybe you're uncertain that it'll by 100 centimeters, a meter, or two meters. And then the prediction horizon shrinks, sometimes slowly, sometimes very rapidly. So what chaos is, is the ability to predict near term, but the inability to predict out beyond a certain horizon under certain conditions. And under certain really bizarre conditions, that horizon can shrink really very close to the present. So this is what chaos is. Another way to say this is sensitivity to initial I'll try to explain what that means uh, in a bit. But I want to run you through a, a series of a couple of chaotic masterpieces. They're like, like paintings by one of the masters. Um, one is, uh, the first one is the simplest one. Uh, it's, uh, it's a chaotic attractor that was proposed by a chemist named Rosler. And uh, Tim's simulation here looks at points in three-dimensional space. This is a three-dimensional set of equations. And he takes a bunch of initial points. Those are little stars. 
And he follows those points on the, the deterministic laws which govern their time evolution. And after a while, all these points congregate to a single set, which is localized in space. And that set is called an attractor because all of the initial conditions sort of ooze down to that. So that's the name we use, an attractor attracts initial conditions. This is what the set looks like. It attracts all initial conditions. And it's strange because it looks like nothing we'd ever seen before. And again, <coughs> we're physicists, we're scientists. If we don't understand what's going on, we're honest about it. We say, okay, well, I don't know what we're talking about. This is strange. We're not bankers or politicians. We don't disseminate whatever. <coughs> so this uh, strange attractor is generated by a very simple mechanism called a stretch and pull mechanism. And I'll try to illustrate this on this uh, cartoon here. Imagine you have a point on this cartoon and it evolves in a circle of ever-growing radius until it reaches this part of the cartoon. And when it reaches this part, this actually is folded over. So when it reaches this part, it gets re-injected back into the center. And it just continues winding out until it gets here and gets re-injected back. So there's a mechanism for uh, generating this bizarre thing, this strange attractor, called stretch and pull, which is uh, illustrated in this next simulation. Here's the Rosser attractor again, this strange, bizarre thing. And here's the intersection of this attractor with this plane, half plane, which is anchored on an axis to the hole in the middle. You can see when the plane sweeps past here, the attractor is stretched, and then it's folded over. And finally, this is pushed down into the base plane. The whole process starts again. So what's going on here is a process uh, that we call stretching and folding. And then the next cycle, you stretch and fold again. And you keep on doing this. Uh, it's like you go into a baker shop, a little baker's boutique, and you watch the baker. He takes his dough and he stretches it and folds it, stretches it and folds it. So imagine you start at the first with just a single layer and you fold it over. You have two layers, each half as thick as before. And you do it again. You have four layers, each quarter as thick as when you started. You do it again. You have eight and then 16. And you have a flaky structure, uh, flakier even than I am. You have uh, something that the French papers would call milk for, uh, something with a thousand even more uh, layers. In it. This is called a fractal science. So if I probe the Rosser attractor in this direction, what I'd see is layer after layer after layer of this fractal structure. And that's caused by the repetition of two processes, the stretching and the folding. So what we set out to do, one of our objectives, was to determine, uh, is it possible to classify uh, all those strange attractors uh, in three dimensions? And we're helped by understanding the, uh, the Lorentz attractor. The Lorentz attractor was developed by Lorentz. He appropriated a model that somebody else developed to describe atmospheric processes. And he uh, discovered a strange attractor that looks like this. Since it's been on television a lot, probably a lot of people have seen this. It looks like a mask, it's a funny kind of mask. <coughs> and in this attractor, an initial condition starts here, winds around on one side, gets too far away, and gets dumped over to the other side. Uh, and this process repeats back and forth forever. <coughs> Tim developed a mechanism to show uh, sensitivity to initial conditions using uh, the Lorentz attractor. <coughs> the attractor consists of a set of uh, three equations which describe the evolution of a point in space. So imagine we have a space with three coordinates, x, y, and z. And uh, I start, I, I pick a point, and look where it goes forever into the future. 
<coughs> well, I can predict if, if I tell you exactly where the bank is in 20, 30 decimal places, 